for this title. And he's got to go to Middlesbrough and get something. And, and I'll tell you, honestly, I will love it if we beat them. Love it. Yes, everyone, welcome to another edition of the Wanda. I've got Danny Higginbottom here for his hat trick. I think this is actually the first proper hat trick we've had for anyone, yeah. so I might have to get you a, a special one down match ball that. sorted out. Um, Danny, what a horrible season we've just had. And we've just been talking about, about positivity and negativity, yeah. and unfortunately, there's not really many ways you can paint last season, except yeah. in a no, generally negative light. It's frustrating. I think, obviously, United have been used to having so much success for for such a long amount of time dominating the plays that they've had and it's a long way from that at the moment and I think it's a case of being patient. Do you think expectations need to be tempered? Because yeah. I, I agree and on one hand I get that but on the other hand you've got a lot of people going well this is Manchester United and we should expect more. Yeah I, I get that, they expect more you know there's no one that's a bigger fan of United than, than myself you know I've grown up a red all my family are as well and you, you have to you can't keep looking back. That's the one thing I would say. You know, I go back to when I was younger. So you go back to the '99 team, then you go to the 2008, 2009 team, and even periods in between there when they were dominating. Mm. You know, you look at look at some of the players from from those particular uh, eras. They've still not been replaced, and that's the problem. When you have a team that has such great success, you can go back to Liverpool in the '70s and, and the early '80s. When you have players of that magnitude, the world class players, you enjoy them while they last because you know. Realistically, when they leave the club, for whether they're getting older, whether they're going to pastures new, they're going to be very difficult to replace. And United are, a, are at a point now where it's a rebuild mm. and it's not going to be a quick fix. I think the problem that they've had really since Sir Alex Ferguson left is looking for quick fixes. But the problem is when you get a quick fix, it's the finished article. And more often than not, a finished article you can't build your team around because they're at their peak whether it be 28, 29, you know, you want to start looking at the younger players that are rough around the edges, can improve, can grow with the team. Therefore, you can build a team that can that can compete for the next eight or nine years instead of having to try and rip it up. Well, having to rip it up every, every three or four years or two or three years, which is what we've seen a lot of recently. But even Fergie, it took him six, seven years to try and really yeah. get that blend. And, and he was bringing in established stars, the likes of Brian McClare, to blend in with the younger players that he was bringing through the academy. I, I do agree that that, for me, is what United do. You've got to bring in some established stars mm -hmm. to sort of shepherd this young flock through the, the, through the chicanes that they're going to have to go through. But it almost feels like we're overloaded with either players at or past the peak and younger players that aren't quite ready mm. to play 50, 60 games a season. You don't feel like we've got a balance anywhere yet. No, and that comes with not having continuity and consistency with managers. You know, you've got Solskjaer now who's, who's in charge and you know, he's, got, he's got four different managers, players, and they all play different ways. Arguably five. Yeah, well, you, obviously you look at Ferguson, um, look at Moyes, Van Gaal, and Mourinho, yeah, right, and, then, and then obviously then you bring Solskjaer into Gibson now. Yeah. <laughs> but But as in terms of those managers bringing players in. So the problem you've got is that Sir Alex Ferguson, greatest manager that I've ever seen, had unbelievable success, nurtured players, brought through great players, brought in great players, played one particular way. David Moyes then comes in, plays a, plays a different way. Van Hart plays a different way. The Mourinho plays a different way. And Social wants to go and play a different way now. So all of a sudden you've got you've got a huge group of players that are all suited to certain mm. aspects of different managers and the way that they play. You look at the top two this season. You know, you look at Guardiola and you look at Klopp. Klopp has built that team slowly but surely. You look at, Four yeah, he, he came in October. I think they finished eighth that season. His first summer signings, Van Elden, Mane and Matip, who were, you know, three of, three of the main players. When those three players were signed, I don't think many people would have looked at it and thought, wow, they're going to be challenging soon. He's done it bit by bit. Southampton pool. Exactly. Southampton. Done it slowly but surely. All of a sudden, you know, a couple of seasons ago, Arguably now one of the best left backs in world football, point from Hull City. Relegate, relegated Hull yeah. and, and that's where I think United, you have to be mindful. You know, it's not all about going and signing players from Real Madrid, going and signing players for PSG, going and signing players from Barcelona. Which we've never done though. Never successfully done. No, because more often than not, when players leave clubs like that, it's because the club doesn't want them anymore. 
You know, so what you have to try and do then is say, right, okay, can we get young, hungry players that can grow, that can play the way that Solskjaer wants to play, that have the energy, that have the fitness, that have the desire? And that's why I'm all for it. You see Dan James coming, I think he's going to be an outstanding signing. You know, I saw bits of him last season when he was Do you think he's a 50 player a season, though? Or do you think he's 25? Because I think he's more 25. I think at the moment, yeah, because obviously you know he's got he's got youth on his side, and it's going to take a little bit of time for him to adapt and get and get used to the situation. Then you talk about Wan Bissaka; it's all younger players, and I think that's what's needed at United now because there is a group of senior players within the squad, and there does need to be there does need to be a reshape, a reshuffle, and the problem that hopefully is not encountered is time. Because now you, you give Ole Gunnar Solskjaer the job. I think he's the right man. I think you've got to give him the opportunity. He's not even had one transfer window yet. And already people are questioning him. I've never known anything in my life uh, when it comes to managers who are Solskjaer. One day is the best. The next day is the worst. But that's the same with the players. The players are, are lurching from a lot of the online fan bases saying greatest thing ever mm. worst thing ever on the back of a single performance yeah. the, the, the overreactionary thing I think is rife in the game and I think it's a massive problem in the game at the moment but, and that's why I think you have to strip everything back and say right this is the situation United are in at the moment they are the sixth best team in the Premier League which was shown last season they're not the top two in my opinion as much as it pains me to say it, I think Manchester City and Liverpool are a long way ahead I thought at times especially under what we sort of ended with Mourinho I think our frailties have been really exposed by trying to play a different system. Mm -hmm. I think Mourinho kind of knew what he had yeah. and cut it accordingly. I think we was the third best team under Mourinho. Yeah. I, I think our frailties have been exposed trying to play a different system. I and suppose, we've gone, oh my God, we I suppose are way the, behind. I suppose the frailties, but also other teams responding and other teams progressing. I think that's a big thing. And that's why I think when you look at with Solskjaer, you don't expect him to come in and all of a sudden, right, we're going to be challenging the top two next season. No. You know, my, my opinion is is that it's something you want. Yes, that is the ideal. You want to be challenging Liverpool and Manchester City. And I've heard so many people say, well, if United go out and get this player, get that player and this player and that player, then they're going to be right up there with Liverpool and Man City. Are Liverpool and Man City not going to sign players? That, and that, that's what people forget. Sometimes you have to sign players to stand still. And the problem with United, it's been in recent seasons, it, it, it's been, and I go back to it, has been quick fixes. It's been plays that can do a job for a season or a season and a half, but then age or form will go against them. So therefore, you then have to write it off and you have to start again. Mm. And that's not a position that, when you look at United, you want them to be bringing in young players that have got eight to ten years of stability within the club, can grow with the football club, can grow with the manager, can understand, take everything in that a manager wants. Because like in anything in life, as a footballer, when you get older, you you become more stubborn. You become more reluctant to change. Because no, no, I'm not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. But I, I was the same as a got older myself. Listen, n not a level anywhere near United, but it doesn't matter what level you're playing well, at. Well, you was. But when you get to a certain age, you become a little bit reluctant to change. So when a new manager comes in and goes, right, lads, this is how we're going to play now. Whether you want to or not, the older you get, the less likely you're going to want to do that. It's the way, it's the way of the world. There's also um, extensive studies that have been done, isn't there, that um, fixing something or you know, training out bad habits or mm. established habits takes like six times longer than learning something new. So when you've mm -hmm. got a younger player... He can pick up what you're trying to show him a lot faster than someone who's had four or five managers' yeah. way of playing, way of thinking embedded into him, and then he's got to learn another new trick. It takes way more time to do that than it does to almost give like you know someone like a Mason Green. You go, I want, to play, I want you to play that way. Yeah, and he can pick it up like that. Yeah. Whereas if you take Lukaku, you go, he's got Moises Everton. He's got, I think he was. Hmm, not sure if he was there with Moyes actually, but either way, he's got all of these mm. different systems from Chelsea, from West Brom, from everywhere. Yeah. And then you want to try and have him play this way as well. And I think that maybe that's what another thing that the benefit of young players is that they're a blank canvas. Well, one hundred percent. And young players are a sponge. You know that they they have this first for knowledge. They want to learn, and in order for them to grow and to be able to learn, you want them to be able to take in what the manager's instructions are but if it's one manager this season then it's another manager the next season another manager the next season it's a problem when you look at the great teams if we were to talk about them now spend two or three minutes on, on each of the, the, the top teams at the moment we know exactly how they want to play we know how they're going to attack a game because United have had so, so many changes in such a short space of time as in terms of a manager you don't know no. I, I've, I've gone into games watching United in the past 
having known the starting 11, not knowing whether it's a three at the back, whether it's a four at the back, not knowing that after 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Where, whereas you watch a team like Manchester City, okay, at times they can play the three, but you know what their aim is. You know the way that they're going to play. There's no surprises. There's no player playing in a completely different position than what he's ever played before. Yeah, you see Herrera playing centre half, McTominay playing centre half exactly. sometimes and go, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. And and that that's that's the problem. And and like I say. You know, success comes from consistency, it comes from continuity, and I think that that's something that United have missed for such a long time. Mm. Obviously, since Sir Alex Ferguson left, you know, they've had a number of different players that, that haven't worked out for whatever reason, and now is the time where I have to take a step back, I have to take a deep breath, and understand the position that United are in now. You can't go, because what what's happened over the last few years has been quick fix after quick fix right okay let's do this let's not forget season before last United finished second but look where look where that ended up that that was a quick fix we finished second but bought no first team players mm. we bought a third choice goalkeeper a second choice fullback and you know and a rotation midfielder mm -hmm. that wasn't going to bridge the gap of 19 points no. to Manchester City no with the aging that was going on in the rest of the squad at the exactly. same time exactly and, it, and it, it can do like you just said it can do for a one-off season but it's not going to lead, it's not going to lead it's not going to lead to an established threat of getting into that top two, winning the Premier League title again. It takes time, and this is where when you look at Social when he first came into the club, you could see what he wanted to do. In my opinion, I've said it before and I'll say it again: Manchester United's biggest problem when Social came in was that okay, like I say, it started brilliantly, started really well, counter attacking. One of the best. It, it honestly felt like United were back. Didn't yeah, it? one one of the best in the business when you're playing counter attacking, but. Counter-attacking is, is a situation where you conserve energy. You sit back, you break quickly, so you look at Chelsea um, in the FA Cup, I think it was Chelsea in the FA Cup, wasn't it? Yeah, you look at Arsenal, thing in the FA Cup as well. You look at Tottenham in the league, you know, and it was brilliant. It was fantastic football to We watch. countered, but we weirdly, we pressed at the same time as countering, mm. didn't we? we? We put them under pressure in certain areas to win the ball back, and then we hit them fast and got behind them quickly. I don't think it was us like parking the bus to then hit them on the break, was it? I thought it was... Uh, I thought it was good. What yeah. Did. Well, in in that way, that's something that Liverpool and Manchester City do really well. They have the two presses: the front three, stroke four or five. They will press. If that press is beaten, then they'll get back and then they can sit a little bit deeper. You know, Manchester City do it at times. Liverpool do it at times. And what you're doing then at times, you're allowing the opposition to come forward. Then United played split strikers. It was brilliant. They allowed the fullbacks to go forward and then got behind them. Now, that was great at first. It was brilliant because. It was new, it was fresh, it was exciting, and the adrenaline was pumping from all the players. Mm. But when you look at the way that Mourinho wanted to play and the way that Solskjaer wants to play, it's two completely different fitness levels. It's not saying one's right and one's wrong, but if you have one fitness level for the way that Mourinho wants to play and then you take it onto the other side with how Solskjaer wants to play. And we were the the least hard-working team in mm. the league under Jose as well. Like, mm. The least running, at yeah. least. Now, that doesn't, now, what people automatically assume is that that's lazy. It's not, it's not that that's lazy. That is the way that Mourinho wanted to play the game. He wanted to be defensively strong and then break quickly. But what was happening was at that point was that... It's also solid, sorry, isn't it? It's, it's, if you're not hairing all out of position all the time as well and you know where your position is, you don't need to move too no, much. It, it, and it can be successful, but what happened and why it ended up going against Mourinho was that all of a sudden your forward thinking plays that you won high up the pitch were probably 15, 20 yards deeper because they were having to do the defensive side of things. So they weren't able to go and express themselves going forward. And because they were, were dealing with so much pressure at certain times, they were going to concede goals. There's no doubt about it. Marino's one of the best defensive coaches around, but it didn't end up working in the end. Then you flip it over and then Solskjaer comes in, he wants to play a completely different way. Now I don't care if you have this, there are different levels of fitness within football. I've seen it myself before. I've been at one club, then I've moved in January to another club who are on another level completely fitness-wise. And the warm-up on a Monday morning after they'd had a game on a Saturday, I struggled to, to finish for the first few months. That was me adapting to the, way the, to the way that the manager wanted his team to play. That was when I went to Southampton under Gordon Strachan and I think we finished eighth in the, eighth in the league. Now that's one player, that's me, you can deal with that to a certain extent. But if you've got a selection, a big group of players that are used to this fitness, and then all of a sudden to get into this fitness, it's impossible. It's so that you cannot do it within the season because you've got games. And that's why as the season went on, in my opinion, that's why injuries started to occur because they were trying to get to a fitness level to play the way that Solskjaer wanted to play. But in doing that, obviously, 
when you get to a certain level, you can get injuries if, you're, if, you, if your body's not used to being pushed that hard. And that's why I think pre-season coming up now is going to be absolutely massive because pre-season's huge. What's going to happen then in pre-season? Because 1st of July, I think the lads are back. Mm. And then by the 10th or 11th of July, they're in Australia. Yeah. Can you do that much in 10 days? You will, pre-seasons have changed now. You go back to clubs fit. You go back to clubs fit. It, it, it's not where it used to be years and years ago where you just have the summer Put the Chris down on the Sunday yeah. night and then crack on. <laughs> yeah, and then... <laughs> no more Ben and Jerry's love. <laughs> come back one one Monday morning and go, right, okay, we're going. It's, it doesn't work like that now. Because the way football is, because of the scientific side of it, because of how professional it is, you actually come back with a certain amount of fitness. Then it's worked on. And then what you will what you will probably look at and say, right, okay, the pre-season games, because United will have a number of pre-season games, as well as doing stuff in training, Pre-season games are part of pre-season training. Exactly, part of pre-season training. It's an extension of pre-season training. So therefore, you understand what the manager wants. You get your fitness levels. You're playing all different types of altitude, all different types of temperatures. So that's the idea of getting it. And then even when the season starts, you still, in my opinion, I would always say you have to play four or five games before you are up to your your not your maximum, but before you're getting towards that. We got Chelsea fitness. and Wolves first two weeks. Yeah. We can't afford five weeks into the season to still be get into our level can we if we're going to hit this high tempo Solskjaer yeah. system don't we need to be ready for Chelsea but that's the same for every team I think you know whatever team you don't I, have a manager so well yeah <laughs> well, whatever, whatever team I was at and you know I would speak to teammates as well that first game of the season you feel good but you're not you're not at your fittest level because you played pre-season games but you've not played Premier League games you know, you've not got that complete match fitness that comes after quite a few games but I think from Solskjaer's perspective, the biggest thing he will be wanting to get across pre-season is how he wants to play, how he wants the team to line up, players, individuals in certain positions, how they are going to be on the ball and how they're going to be off the ball. And we saw, we saw, um, we saw examples of that, especially when he first took over. Mm. You know, I, I loved watching United when he first took over. You know, a lot of the time it was a four-three-three. The width would come from the full-backs, and. What I, what I loved about watching United then was the, the width was coming from the fullbacks all the time. I think at the time it was Ash Young and Luke Shaw. They would play as wingers as well. But what that meant then was that your front three and Pogba could go and join in. So you had a front four that were really close together. Your two wide players in that front three didn't have to play as wingers. So your centre forward wasn't isolated. When the ball went to him, how many times did we see the intricate passing between the likes of oh, Lukaku, Rashford, Lingard, Pogba? It was brilliant. That's been an issue, that isolated forward. Yeah. How many times have you seen Rooney, Falcao, Falcao mm -hmm. looking ordinary. Yeah. Unbelievable. And the people that have failed to a certain extent, Zlatan, Lukaku, mm. you're like, these are top yeah, forwards yeah. and they don't quite look like it. So it was always systematic at United. Yeah, and I think Solskjaer's tried to look at it the other way and go, right, okay, people talk about United defensively, but let's turn on its head and let's let's look at it and say, right, okay, our best form of defence is to attack and that's what they that's what they tried to do. And that's what they did, you know, successfully on, on, on a number of games. And they always have what I call a box, which was the two centre backs and the two defence midfielders sitting. Because if you are one of the dominant teams in the Premier League, which United will be in the majority of their games in terms of owning possession, you're most open to the counter attack. So you have to be able to have four players behind the ball at all times. You look at Liverpool, they do it with two, two centre backs, two defence midfielders. We've even seen at times a full back coming inside to make up that that second central midfielder. Manchester City do unbelievably well with the two centre-backs, Fernandinho, and then we see Walker coming inside. You know, the, the, those are the two teams, really, that have done it as well as anybody because mm. they know they can be open to the counter-attack, but they've always got four players behind the ball that can cover the width of the pitch. And that's what United did well to a certain extent. And because you commit so many men forward, when you lose the ball, you're talking about the high press, they've now all of a sudden got six players in the opposition half, so they can press high. And that's what I, that's what I believe will be will be Solskjaer's formula because if you look at it the way that he was trying to play, the way that he did play at times, that it, seems it's to also be sort of, of what he wanted to, to a do. certain extent what he did at Mulder. That was a system yeah. that we you could see like the day it was announced. I was having new radiators fitted, so yeah. I just downloaded as much Mulder games as I mm -hmm. could, and I watched seven straight hours of Mulder, yeah. just making a load of notes and going. Ah, okay, I see what you're trying to do here. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a bit of a hybrid of what Klopp's doing and what Pep's doing. Yeah, it's course. very possession-based. Yeah. It's certainly pressing. Yeah. Uh, and then there's there's obviously his own little personalities that get thrown into it there. How is that delivered in pre-season? Is that on the pitch? Is that meetings? Is that presentations? Everything. Is it it's, all, everything? It, it's everything. I think it's, it's presentations. I think it's probably, I would imagine, 
clips from this season, good bits, bad bits, um, and then you go out on the pitch and you work on it because that that's how you get used to it. You know, you work on playing in that system. Other players within the squad will work on playing against that system to understand how difficult it is to play against the system. But regardless of anything, it will take it takes time. Players have to adjust. Players have to be able to to be given time to adjust into that. And that's why that's why I say even from. From my perspective, I want United to be challenging for the league mm. next season. But in the same time, I'm also realistic and think, right, okay, this just a league and cup double. Yeah, that's it. That, that's all. Don't anything more than that. <laughs> you have to be realistic, and now more than anything is when the time patience is needed. People, people come back and say, well, hang on a second. We've had Van Gaal, we've had Mourinho, we've had Moyes. You know the. That, that's not continuity. That's not stability. It's got to reset every single time. Exactly. It? it has to be. I worry he goes though. I worry if he doesn't advance us up in the league, which is going to be well hard. Because mm. if if Wolves have another summer like they had last summer, they're not going to. Yeah. Have that. And they're not on their own. So then, so then United don't change the, what they're doing at the moment because it's not been successful for them now. My worry when Mourinho went without a plan, without a possible director of football with the power to actually enact change and move the club forward in mm. to a plan, was that we'd enter in what Chelsea are, which is, you got nine months of a manager, and then he's gone. you got ten months of a manager, then he's gone. Real yeah. Madrid have had it for the last 15 years, bar Mourinho. Yeah. How has he done? Yeah. United, I don't think, should want to be seen as that type of club. You know, I, I go back to when I was a, when I was a kid there and... You know, God bless her, I went to, to Eric Garrison's funeral a few months ago. And the amount of faces that were there that are still associated with the club. And that's what made United unique. I hadn't seen some of them for, for 20 years since I left the club. Yet it was as though you'd just seen them yesterday. That's what United, that's what made United such a special club for me growing up, being there, from leaving there, from coming back and playing against the great Manchester United teams. Seeing people that you remember from when you were 12, 13, 14 years of age that know the DNA of the football club. Let's go back to what you said about Sir Alex Ferguson. Mm. When he took the job, the first thing was that he wanted to do was was wrestle back the youth system, bring the players on board. Eric Harrison was obviously already there, but it wasn't Sir Alex Ferguson and all these different coaches. Through time, he appointed coaches. He brought coaches in that saw the game in the same way that he did. And that's imperative, that's so important. I want to be able to, if I'm a manager of a football club, you're the reserve team manager. I want to be able to turn around to you and go, right, okay, who have you got coming through? I want to be able to trust you and, and trust your judgment, knowing that you're on the same page as me and you say, well, he's, he's ready. Okay, bring him with me. But at the moment, it's not like that. You've got so many different coaches, even when you go down the ladder, what is the United DNA at the moment? That's the problem. United had a DNA from 10 years of age. I remember being there, Nobby Styles was my coach. United legend, Brian Kidd. Football legend. Can we have that right, please? Yes, football, football legend. legend. Sorry, Should be yeah, sir. Football. Yes. Should be sir. Yeah, that's another argument, and you're completely right as well. Then you had Tony Whelan, you had Paul McGuinness, you had Jim Ryan, all associated with the football club, whether it be playing at the football club, whether it be being a coach of the club for a long time, all the way up to Sir Alex Ferguson. So he was the leader, but everybody below him, they all sung off the same hymn sheet. At the moment, it's not like that. Mm. It's it, it, it's so far away from that. Isn't there something in the fact that I, I did a recent history episode uh, looking into Sir Matt Busby, which is actually great learning about things that he didn't yeah. know about the guy. He only took the United job on the basis that he was given control of the football club because he thought he knew more than the directors. And that was mm. weird at the time yeah. for a manager to take control of that. And I mean, you look at what he ended up doing as a football yeah. manager with the club. I think he did all right, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. Um, so Alex Ferguson, the same thing. He wanted totalitarian control of the football club and then built it in his image. Don't you think it's only fair that if Solskjaer's given this role, which he's got, he needs to have that totalitarian control over every aspect of it? I think that should be the case with all managers because if you're brought in to the football club as a manager and you sign all the players and you fail, then a manager, would have, a manager would have no problem with that. But what we're seeing at so many different clubs is, is, is players coming to, to the club that have not been asked to bring to, to be brought in by the manager. So I'm not saying that a manager in, to, in today's age of football should, should come in and say, right, okay, I'm going to do everything. What he should be able to do are bring in people that believe the same things that he believes in as, as football have the same just have the same outlook on the way that football is so therefore then what you've got is a manager 
but you've also got people all around him mm. that are the same as him. So therefore, it takes the pressure off the manager then. You don't have to worry about, right, who's this player we're signing? You don't have to worry about, oh, what about this young lad? I'm not too sure about him. Because you've got people all around you that see the game the same way as you do. And that's what brings success. And that's what you talk about continuity and, and stability. Now, I look at social at the moment, and the biggest thing when he first got the job on, on a caretaker basis, then when he got his permanent, biggest thing for me was I wasn't, I wasn't bothered where United finished in the league because it wasn't a great season. I was more bothered about what happened behind the scenes because you need a director of football. Mm. Liverpool have shown that, Manchester City have shown that, and the reason I talk about those two teams is because well, they, are the the stand, stand, they are the they're, they're the two standout teams. Then you look at teams like Bayern Munich, you look at teams like Ajax. It's no surprise that the directors of football or whatever title you want to give them, same with Dortmund, they have players used to play for the club, know the club inside out, and that's the most important thing. And I think over the last few years, United don't have, at the moment, an identity. They need to grab hold of that identity and they need to bring it back because it's been lost. Do you know the guy I was talking about earlier with the hoodie? Yeah. The bit of paper that he was writing on, the one word he was writing and making a box out of was identity. It is. It's huge. If you don't have identity, you don't have anything. And that's when... You know, you, you hear the names being mentioned about certain roles at United. Former players, brilliant. Especially the person I mean, the personality that's been talked about there, Real Ferdinand, yes. um, Patrice Everett, Darren yeah. Fletcher. I think, well, I've, I've said as a laugh, almost as a laugh, that you saw Real Madrid appoint the likes of Zidane as, as ambassadors that went mm -hmm. and helped recruit. Now imagine if United had Beckham, Everett, Cantona, Rio. Imagine any of them knocking on your door to be like... Do you want to come and play? Um, how about you come and play for United? Yeah. Uh, okay, where do I sign? Yeah, but and that's that's what other clubs have got. And if you if you had something like that, imagine the, the players that you just mentioned sitting down with a prospective sign and saying, club's, club's a little bit down at the moment, but I tell you what, period when I was here, when we won the treble, when we won the Champions League... Come here and look at these trophies. Yeah. Do you want to be part of this? Straight away, you're like, tell you what, this is brilliant. And that's where the likes of Bayern Munich, Dortmund, Real Madrid, Ajax, that's what, they, that's what they've done. You look at the people that are at the forefront, mm. that are the decision makers, they're all football people. Now, football has gone more towards business than, than it ever has been, you know, and we have, to, we have to accept that, that's the way that it is. And United as a business, unbelievable. But from my perspective, I look at it, I think to myself, what do you want to be? Is it Manchester United Business Club or is it Manchester United Football Club? As I guarantee you now, it, sure as eggs are eggs, if you have success, if you have success on the pitch, you're going to be a great business. Well, that's the one I always say is like, if you tell me that they're great at business, I disagree. I don't think they're great at that that, that great at mm. business. The revenues have gone up for for, for Norwich. The revenues mm. have gone up for City. The revenues have gone up for every single football club, certainly in the Premier League, to astronomical levels. United has gone up about, you know. Two, three times. Mm. We was making a lot of money. We're still making a lot of money. We've not outstripped the competition. We're just making money. We was always going to make money. But the, the fundamental thing, like you just said, is look at Real Madrid at the moment. They're talking about La Decima. You know, how many European Cups have you won? Mm. We've not won enough. For the way we go on about being the biggest club in the world, we've not won enough. Mm. We haven't totally obliterated the opposition in England. Liverpool are two behind us. That might be one behind us next season. Yeah. We, we're not 15, 20 titles ahead and an uncatchable amount of, FA, um, of Champions Leagues ahead. If you want to be the most successful football team in the world, start there. That's it. Start with, with the most successful football team. Yeah, that, and, and, and everything else will fall into place. Easily. But at the moment, it seems that the business side and is actually more important than what's going on on the football pitch. Where, like we just said, take care of business on the football pitch, everything else falls into place. Can you imagine how many people, when we win the European Cup, we've got the Ballon d'Or winning Ronaldo, we're European Cup champions, we are Premier League champions, we're in the middle of doing three on a, on a row, mm -hmm. we've got some top players that are marketable, Wayne Rooney, Ronaldo, you know, even Rio Ferdinand mm -hmm. at the time, very marketable players, mm -hmm. Very good football team, winning things. Can you? You probably have to hire someone just to answer the phone for commercial deals. Yeah. They've been. They just had the pick of anything mm. that they wanted. That's what it should be about. Yeah. You do that first, and then the business side is only surely, only surely there to support the football side. Yeah, but but in anything there will be there will be cycles, and that's where United are in this cycle now, where you have to strip everything back mm. and go right. Okay, at the moment. 
we're not one of the top two teams in the Premier League. It's as simple as that. So you have to say, right, okay, how how can we get back there? Okay, well, it, it's brick by brick. If you if you want to build a house, but you're building it without foundations, it's just going to crumble. It's not going. It, it's not going to be successful. So what you do, you bring a manager in place, Solskjaer. He knows the club inside out. He's got to be given time. He's got. He's got to exactly. He's got to be given time. Which you know what? It's it, it it's pointless. You bring someone in like Solskjaer, knows the club inside out, was here during the glory years, learnt from the great Sir Alex Ferguson, had teammates who, you know, would run through a brick wall for the football club. You then have Mike Phelan. Was a player at the club as well, had success as a player, then was an assistant manager. 99 to 2013, Mike was there. Yeah. Did all right in that time, I'd say. <laughs> not, not bad at all. <laughs> but he was key as well, bringing younger players through. Then you bring Michael Carrick into the equation. One near enough everything there is to win. Mega underrated. Unbelievable player. So all of a sudden, just, just with those three, you have so much knowledge about the football club. Yeah. Allow them to get on with what they want to do. Everybody, those three, those three individuals will want United to be back at the top more than anybody. So they are going to do it in the way that they believe possible. And it isn't going to be, like I say, it's not going to be a quick fix. Listen, they may sign a few, may sign a few players or something. They may have an unbelievable season. But in order to have consistency and to do it like United did in the nineties and in the two thousands early on, you have to have. There has to be a game plan, there has to be an identity, and there has to be progression within that. You can't keep saying, right, okay, I'm going to go and sign this player, he'll do us for two years, then we're going to lose him for nothing, or we're going to lose money on him, and then it, that doesn't make business sense. No. If, you, if, you want to, if you want to look at it from a business perspective, it certainly doesn't make football sense. So what you've got to say is, right, okay, can we get players, whether, whether, whether they be British players or whether they be foreign players, can we get players from the age of, I don't know, 19 to say 23, 24, go... You, you can go up to certain positions to say 26, 27 and say, right, okay, for the next five, six, seven years, the, these players, they're going to be the mainstay of this team. They're not necessarily going to play week in, week out, but they're going to be the mainstay of this team. And what that enables is, is to hopefully bring success. But new players start to come through the door. I tell you what, go and have a sit down with him. He's been here for six years. He knows how this club is. He knows how this team is expected to play. The, the issue we've got at the moment is that those players that have been here eight, nine, ten years are some of the worst players in the team. That's what I think our massive issue is. It's not Wayne Rooney's, it's not mm. Paul Scholes, it's not Ryan Giggs, it's some people that you go, I'm not even sure you should be starting. Mm. I think that's a massive issue. But that that is, that's the problem that United have at the moment. They do have, you know, they do have a squad which, which has players that are you know, getting towards the last stages of their of their career. We're bought for one purpose, for, for one manager. We're not necessarily bought as first choice. Mm. And it just ends up a mismatch. Now, there are players that... We, we've seen it happen before. We've seen players go from one big club to another big club. And you've been like, what's happened to him? He didn't suit the way, the, the way that the team he's gone to was wanting him to perform. You know, the idea... And that's when I look at United. I look at United over the... Over the you know the the last few years, they bought players in, but then played them in different positions. You know, Di Maria was was the prime example. You know, he got champ, champions, uh, he got man of the match in the Champions League final, and then he comes to United, played in a completely different position. You know, if you're going to bring players in, the reason you bring players in is because they've caught your eye playing in a specific position. Yeah, you go, that's a jigsaw piece. We exactly, need. but it's it doesn't feel as though it's been part of a jigsaw. Players coming in, it's it's as though it's been players coming in because they're good players. It's great, you well, know, to sign good players. It feels like we're buying jigsaw pieces without knowing what the picture is. Exactly. Now, without having a continuous manager, you're never going to get that. You're not going to be allowed to do that. And like I say, I go back to it. You look at you look at Klopp. His first transfer window in the January came in the October, the January didn't really sign anybody. All his players were on trial. And the one thing I would say about Sorska, about him coming in from from when he came into the end of the season. Not at the moment, and it will not feel like it, but it could end up being a positive. Because I'm sure there will have been players when he first came in that he thought, right, brilliant, these are going to do for me. Not too sure about them once they're not for me. There will have been a number of players that will have changed his mind either way. So he will be now set in his mind, these are for me, these aren't for me. If he'd have come in and had an unbelievable, you know, if his runner had carried on all the way to the end of the season, what would... It, I think I'd be in a um, rehab, I reckon. Yeah, it, it, would have, it would have been unbelievable, <laughs> but 
how much would he have learned? Hmm. You know, so sometimes before success comes a little bit of a fall. And I just think that one of the things that you try and take away from it, you, you try and take some positives out of what's happened is that Social would have learned a lot about his players since he took over. You know, the players that can step up, the players that can't, the players that are suited to the way that he wants to play, the players that aren't suited to the way that he wants to play. Now, he now, like we just said, he needs to be given the time over this transfer window and the next few transfer windows to say, right, listen, he needs to go, I want to bring him in. You look at Guardiola when he went to Manchester City, he said, doesn't matter who it was, didn't matter whether they were big players or not, get him out, get him out, get him out. They were gone. Even if it meant that the club had to, to supplement. Yeah, or them. sometimes they had to, they got rid of the ones he brought in as well. Exactly. But... Managers will make mistakes as well. So Alex Ferguson, the greatest manager I've ever seen, he will have made some mistakes in the well, transfer window. Talking about rebuild, the rebuild from that treble winning team, the one that won three in the row, uh, 99, 2000, 2001. Yes, we won another league in 2003. But I, that wasn't really a team with an identity, I don't mm. think. I think it was just a team with a collection of individuals good enough to win a league. Mm. It wasn't you know, that 99 era this was a weird thing in the middle and then it was all the way up until 2007 when we actually won the league again mm. I think you're looking at a six year project from that 2001 dismantling all the way back up to yeah. when we won three in a row again uh, 06 uh, sorry 07, 08, 09 that team and that in between if you look at from 2001 2002 you're bringing in Veron didn't really quite mm. suit the system I thought he was a phenomenal player yeah. at times but he was half keen, half skulls, and we had keen and skulls. Um, bringing Rio Ferdinand. Mm. Not perfect at the time, didn't look great alongside Sylvester, or eventually, you get the right partner, best defender in the Avenger. world. You bring in Wayne Rooney. Um, it's like buying Mbappe now almost, mm. the excitement level. You bring in Ronaldo, young player with a lot, of, a lot of hype around him. Three years of absolute frustration, kicks into the best yeah. player the world might have ever seen. But he was adding to that continually. Um, it was the summer of 2005 six or that season. You bring in Vidic, you bring in Evry, you bring in Van der Sar, you bring in Jisung Park. What a summer mm. that, or what a, a transfer season that was. All little jigsaw pieces because he knew the picture he was trying to build. Yeah. And then he added, <laughs> with Rogin gets sacked for some stuff he says on telly. We give Michael Carrick 16. Do you remember the fume that Michael Carrick was getting the number 16 shirt? It took yeah. him a long time to win the crowd yeah. over. But Michael Carrick was the final jigsaw yeah. piece in Fergie's masterpiece that went on to win another Champions League and three and, titles. And I think the the problem that United now have is that you know there's obviously been all the talk about Pogba and the things he's saying about he wants to leave the club and what have you. Um, or maybe it's time for a, a fresh challenge, some, something along them lines. Is the if a player like that, a, a club like United, in years gone by, who is the best player at the club, wants to leave the club, and they do leave the club, there's other players around, not necessarily of, of, of that individual's ability, but mm. there are other players around that can make up for his loss. United aren't in that position at the moment. When Ronaldo went, you know, arguably the, one of the best players in the world at the time, if not the best player in the world at the time, Look at the players that were still around to, I'm not saying cover up the gap or take his place, but to actually lessen the blow. United, if they lose Pogba now, you are, you're going a long way back then because United don't There's have... There's no reason to keep a man that's demanding a little No, there, there, there isn't. I understand that and I agree with that. You know, And, and, and obviously to, to hear him say what he said, yes, it was obviously disappointing as a, as a United supporter. But I'm not talking about the fact of whether Pogba stays or... or, or or goes. What I'm talking about is when you go back to when United were having all the success, you could deal with a player like that leaving. You know, I've I've heard since it was mentioned yesterday, the amount of people that have come out and said, "Well, if he goes, it's not a problem. We're just going to get three players to replace him." This and I'm like, "It's not Tesco, is it? What What are you on, on the about? shelf? What are you on about? Are they just going to come like that and they're just going to magically take his <laughs> take his position? So all of a sudden, if you if you take Popper out of the equation, if he does go, it's it's a, whichever way you want to look at it. I think he's a world class player. Right? Too many times we do look at the negative side of Paul Pogba. Right? When when we talk about and we, we were talking about it off camera, when we talk about Liverpool, when we talk about Manchester City, when we talk about Tottenham, we talk collectively. More weapons. They've got more weapons, you just know, simple as. When, when we talk about Liverpool attacking, we don't single out Firmino, we don't single out Manny, we don't single out Salah. We look at the three of them collectively. When we look at Tottenham, you talk about Kane, you talk about Deli Alli, you talk about Son and you talk about Ericsson. When you talk about Man City, you talk about Aguero, Sterling, both Silvers, De Bruyne. When you talk about United, it's Paul Popper. It's Paul Popper. But, and that's 
that's where you look at it and go, hang on a second, let's let's take a little bit of a step back here. United's team, United squad, if you take Salah, or if you take Firmino, or if you take De Bruyne, you take David Silva, Bernardo Silva, the list goes on, Harry Kane, are they going to do it all on their own? Because that's what's happening at the moment. It seems to be if United play poorly, it can be Pogba's fault. Well, look how well Tottenham coped without Harry Kane. Mm. They coped fine exactly. without him. Yeah, they did. United, you go back to that last real dynasty of United, that one, that, the last Champions League winning team, which is now 10 years ago. Mm. Jesus, 11 years ago. Um, but that team, you you take away Wayne Rooney, you've still got Tevez and Ronaldo. Yeah. You take away Ronaldo, you still had the experience of gigs and you still had skulls in the mix. You know, you take away, you you, you lose a defender, you can throw oh, Johnny yeah. Evans in yeah. because he's alongside Rio Ferdinand. You know, Fergie in, oh, was it a... 2011, 2012 season, Anderson and Cleverly was bossing midfield mm. because all around them exactly. was still top class. Yeah. Whereas now it's it's not top class. And I mean, I did a video the other day when we were talking about how many of this current side get in the 2009 side. I started the video by saying, just, well, none for mm. starters. And then you go, all right, probably Pogba. Uh, probably, probably Martial on the left because yeah. Giggs was 36 at the time. That's it. Mm. I think Martial up front with Ronaldo and Rooney what a player that yeah. would have been yeah. you put him into that team oh my god put Pogba into that team it probably elevates what Scholes yeah, was doing yeah. in that team yeah. just because of the engine that yeah. he's got on him because Scholes was a bit slow by then and I think I think the problem is as well is that like I say I'm looking at Paul Pogba the footballer now you know I'm not I'm not looking at all the other things that people say about him about <laughs> his hair quarter by him, what have you I look at him as a footballer and yes do you know what he gets criticism um, his mannerisms, the way that he carries himself on the pitch. You know, I've played with players no way near the quality of Paul Pogba that have the mannerisms that look make them look as though they're yeah, not. You're about. But that, that make <laughs> them look as though they're not bothered. But they are bothered. Yeah. And when Paul Pogba came from Juventus, obviously world record fee it was Paul Pogba coming home. He's going to be the missing piece in this jigsaw that was nearly complete. <laughs> The box to box to mid the box to box midfielder. Box to box midfielders do not exist. He was expected to come to United, be the main man. He wasn't the main man at Juventus. He had the likes of Vidal around him, Pirlo around him, exactly. So he could go and express himself, go and do what he wanted to do. Now his 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 rich form, the season that's just finished, it's no surprise it was when Herrera and Matic were there. He could go and express himself, go forward. You know, if if we were to talk about let let's separate them. So if we talk about a. Kante, if we talk about Kante, all right, he's played in a more elevated position this season at Chelsea. But if we talk about Kante's best position, he's a defensive midfielder. Do you expect Kante to be dribbling past three or four players and making that lovely little three pass for the centre forward to get in the end of? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, no. you just wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. So that's like saying to Pogba, well, okay, well, Pogba, you should be going forward, you should be assisting, by the way, the most assists for United, you should be scoring, by the way, the most goals, and people can say penalties this and whatever. He still scored them. You know, scored. I think scored more goals than Firmino, more scored more goals than Son, and the same amount as Lacazette. Most assists for United as well. So the attacking side of things, he's doing that. And let's be honest, he probably set up a, a load more chances as well that weren't put into the back of the net. I'm sure. The amount of times he hit the woodwork himself as well in games. So that that's what you have to look at. But but no, you concentrate on the negatives. And like I say, I'm not talking about off the field. I'm not talking about his comments that he's just come out with. As a United fan, they're disappointing to hear that. I agree 100%. Oh, but I'm, it's quite a bit light, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very, yeah, very disappointing. But yeah, it is. It's, you don't want to hear that. No. You want to hear a player that wants to be at the club. But I'm, I'm forgetting about all that at the minute. I'm saying him on the pitch when he goes onto the pitch. Too many times it's concentrated, he's negative. He can't do this, he can't do that. Well, hang on a second, what, what about the things that he can do? He did it for France, you know, and... It, it's, it's not because all of a sudden he becomes a, a better player when he plays for France. He's able to do it because he's got the platform to go and express himself. And I believe in an ideal world, Pogba would love to stay United in an ideal world. And you build, I would build the team around him. I would say, right, you're my best player. In order for me to, to, to get the best out of my best players, I make them do what they're good at doing. Let's have a look at what Danny, Danny's 11 with Pogba as the centre of it next season would look like. I think we both agree. Juan Bissaka, right back. Yeah, sure, left back. Um, I think Lindelof, and it would be interesting to see whether another centre back does come in. You know, there's obviously been talk about someone like Harry Maguire, um, and then you look at your midfield three. 
<laughs> it's almost a new midfield. Yeah, isn't it? it is. It is. You know, McTominay. I think he's going to be a very good player for United. Um, do you put him in and, and get him playing week in week out? You know, you look at Matic as well. So you could argue that you need to bring one or two defensive midfielders in. I think we need a Ratter, an NDD or, mm-hmm. or yeah. a Drizzt Gay, yeah. somebody like that. I'd like someone with that level of energy. Yeah, Kante would be a good option. You're not getting him out of chance. No, though. no chance. And then when you look at you look at the forward, Decore as well. Good shout. Yeah, you look you look at the forward options. I don't. I think you know forward wise, you, you you've got the likes of Rashford, who I think he's probably been, in my opinion, unfairly criticised as well at times during last season. Um, Martial, it's all about consistency for him. He can be whatever he wants. To can be, he play in a pressing system? Does he have the mentality and the personality to play in a pressing system? I think I think if it's a team where everybody is pressed, you either you either get driven along with them, or it becomes unbelievably noticeable and you're shifted. Mm. So I think you don't you don't look at a player like Marshall and go right, can he do it? You say right, okay, we've got a team that is doing it, and if you're not doing it, it's going to stand yeah, up like a sofa. Get on board, I'll do one. Exactly, um, and then obviously you, you've got the likes of Dan James has come in. Might take a little bit of time for him to settle in. Um, You've got Lingard, Lukaku, you don't know what's going to happen with him. Sanchez. You're looking at this in like a 4 3 3. Yes. Um, we don't really necessarily still have someone to play first choice on that right hand side. I don't think. I don't think Dan James is that guy right now. No, he might he, be by the end of the well, season. Well, it, it, it all depends. If you want to play with inverted wingers, then you know it's, it's getting that either a left footed player over on that side or someone that is very comfortable. Gareth Bale on loan, would on, you take that? Or do you think the wage structures. Too messed up right now as it is. I don't, but it's Gareth Bale is is an unbelievable player. There's there's no denying that. But it's going to be thirty soon. So therefore, that's why alone rather than yeah. invest in buying the guy. But it's it's not it's not creating anything. You're going to lose him. So that's that's the problem. You know, you want to does he not bridge a gap to get Chong through to get Dan James up to speed yeah, to bring it, arg- through? arguably arguably it could do. Arguably it could do, but I don't know whether it's the right way to go for United. And then what we saw when United were at their best last season under Solskjaer was your two sitting midfielders sitting, you know, and you always saw the box. You, took, you saw the two centre-backs and you saw your two defence midfielders. Your width was given completely from your full-backs. Last season it was young and it was sure would go forward. They would be the width. What would happen then is your front three, who at times early on in the season when you're playing with just one front man, got so isolated and I felt sorry for whoever it was whether it was Rashford or whether it was Lukaku all of a sudden your front three they're now playing really close together we saw the intricacy that's of the an issue with Marshall Marshall touches a touchline all day long I don't does mind does he need that. to be told to come in yeah I think if you're a fullback and you're playing against Martial and you're a right back and you're playing against him the worst thing for you to see is for him waiting for the ball in the wide area because you've got to creep out to him all of a sudden you're creating that gap then between yourself and, and your right sided centre back you want him picking the ball up. You don't mind him picking the ball up in the wide areas, but then driving in. And I think the beauty of someone like Martial, if you can get the consistency from him, having Luke Shaw, Martial drives inside, leaves so much space for Shaw to get into. And if he does go wide, that's the space that Pogba was actually getting into exactly. on that left-hand side of the box. And that well. was the problem with Sanchez and Pogba, playing both of them playing on the same side. They would get in each other's way. So it gives you the opportunity to play in different ways. Now, if you're a defender and you're playing against Rashford as a centre forward and he's looking to stretch the game, you are going to continuously drop and drop and drop because you get a foot race with Rashford, more often than not, there's only going to be one winner. I don't know how many are going to beat him. Exactly. So it's centre half anyway. So therefore you drop off. So the knock and effect from that is that, and I've been in this position before, as a defender you drop deep. The midfield of the opposition don't want to drop deep because they want to get about the likes of whoever's playing as your two defence midfielders so they can't get on the play on the ball and dictate play all of a sudden the gap between your defence and your midfield is huge it's where Paul, Paul Pogba comes into his own and that in my opinion is the way like, I look at United I think so you know what they have players that can that can suit that but if Paul Pogba does go you've got to then go and go and replace him and it's okay people say oh well you can do this you can do that it doesn't it's just not, work like it's that not gonna, you're not walking into Asda are you and just pulling a, a player off the shelf like that and the big problem is is that I don't think United should be going out and, and, and buying two or three players at 90 million 100 million I don't think we will no I, I, I don't and I don't think they should do I think they should get younger players 
that can potentially be worth that amount of money that you can build a team around. Gives you three. Three to make something happen for us next oh, year. Wambasaka. I'd, I'd definitely say that, that he's a player that, that I would be looking at. Oh, You can look at someone like Dilip, I guess, but you know, how would he suit the Premier League straight away? There's an argument that he could do a fantastic job. And then you're looking, if you're looking at the the midfield side of things, you can look at someone like Fernandez as well, couldn't you? You know, but the problem is, is that if Pogba wants to go and he does go, all of a sudden, what signal does that send out to possible transfer targets? On the other hand of that, if you're trying to positively spin that, yeah. If you lose the likes of Pogba, I mean, we could be in so much shit if we lose Pogba, mm -hmm. De Gea, Mata, uh, Lukaku. I mean, that's a lot of experience and quality that could yeah. just walk out the door and seems almost likely that that lot could walk out the door. Mm -hmm. That's going to be well hard to replace in one window, yeah. if not three. Yeah. If you lose all of those, I almost think that the players that you bring in are coming for the right reasons. As long as they're not half a million a week. Yeah. If you sign players, let's say you, Pogba goes and you go, all right, we'll bring in James Madison. Mm -hmm. You bring in Wan Bissaka and you bring in Endon Bailey or something like mm -hmm. that. And they're like, not asked that you're in Europa League, not asked that Pogba's gone. I think we've got a good thing going on here and I'd like to be a part of it. Then I go, okay. You know, the Delic thing, I was really keen on if he was coming for those right reasons it seems like we might have just blown everyone out of the water yeah. in terms of wages if we get him there's still going to be a question mark over his motives for being here whereas you know, someone like a you know, Dan James mm. you know that Dan James has come regardless of whoever was on the table and I can't yeah. imagine it was Barcelona who was up against if he was up against mm. anyone I can't imagine that he's gone I'll come to United for the money Yeah, I think he's gone I want to play for United but that, and that's why patience is key with players that are coming in but I, I would probably say that if you're looking to sign 21, 22 year olds, the majority of 21, 22 year olds are gonna be coming for that reason. They're not the finished product, they're not the end product. You know, so they're not coming for, the, they're not straight away saying, oh, I'm gonna to go to United for the money. You know, they, they're coming because they want to learn. And I think the one thing is with Solskjaer and the one thing that he has on his side, you know, he came, I think in 96, I think he was only 23 or 24 himself. The class of 92 were just starting to emerge then. So he's seen what it's like for young players coming through at the club or young players joining the club mm. and he will he will embrace that I don't think there's any doubt about it and that's why like you say we get we get we get too concerned so for example if a player is bought for 15 million pound like Dan, Dan James has been people straight away say can't be a United player he's only bought for 15 million pound we get stuck in all that but on the other hand, you'll also have people complaining that we never sign players to like the, the Maris and the Cantes before they became mm -hmm. like top players yeah. in the Premier League, that we're not doing enough scouting in those yeah. areas. You can't win. No, exactly. So I think what you have to do, instead of judging and saying, right, okay, well, he must be good because he's, he's a £100 million player. Let's strip everything back and go, right, these young players are coming in now. It's going to take a little bit of time for them to bet. And that's why I say, I've said it numerous occasions now since we've been doing that. Patience. Patience is what it's all about. If... You know, like I say, I'm, a, I, I'm speaking from experience as a United supporter. I'm not coming here as a, as a neutral. I want United to do really well, but I'm also I'm also a realist. And I see that United, they are now, they've got to build. They have to build again. There's not been a rebuild. There's been quick fix. Mm. Quick fix on is not long-term planning. You have to now say, right, okay, the type of players we want. We want to sign players that 19, 20, up to the age of 25, 26, dependent on the position that they play. And that's what you do. You look at Liverpool and you look at Manchester City. The majority of signings that, that they've made, other than some goalkeepers they may have had that were in the 30s, have all been of that age range. Well, look at the ones that weren't. I mean, Van Dijk was a little touch older. Yeah. Um, Alisson was a big signing. Mares was later and a, a bit more money. But you're right, Every virtually everybody else that they've signed, Laporte and Stones and all that, like, you see them it's being... long term. Yeah, 10 year. Players. Exactly, it's long term. So... It's hard enough, and we saw Sir Alex Ferguson do it on numerous occasions, rebuilding a team. That must be so difficult. But if you are... Well, even he failed. That, that was the point I was trying to make earlier, actually. Yeah. With how long it took Fergie to yeah. go from that treble-winning team to yeah. that double-winning team, he signed 
one of those every year, but he also signed Jemba Jembers, he also yeah. signed Bellions, he also signed Heinzer, which, I mean, left back winning player of the year. Yeah. And then wanted to go to Liverpool, and I was like, forget him. Yeah. <laughs> but it, he failed as much as he was a success in there, but it was he was allowed the time, the patience, yep. and the money to go and actually put his imprint on this team. And because he got the time, to patience, I'm sure you remember it as, as much as I remember it, the amount of people like Fergie's a dinosaur, Benitez and Mourinho's yeah. a new era. Like these are the ones now that are going to take over. We need to get like Svengo and Eriksson in. All of that sort of stuff was happening around that time, uh, and this was the greatest manager the world has yeah. ever seen. He needed time and money. Of course he did. And I remember Guardiola's first season. You know, people were desperate for him to fail in the Premier League. Talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but people were desperate, and then, and then then when he finished, I think his first season, I think he finished. So Third, he finished third in his first season and was like, oh, look at this, you know, he can't do it in the Premier League, this time, whatever. It took him that little bit of time. You know, you look at Klopp. Everyone was saying that Klopp is, was a fraud and things like that. Come on. <laughs> but he, he isn't. <laughs> but that's been given time. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. And that's why, like I say, the, the more football people you have within a football club behind the scenes the more understanding there's going to be. Is that why we're fucked? I believe you need more football people. You need more football. You look at successful teams, somewhere in the background, there is somebody that understands. They don't necessarily have to have been a footballer, but they have been surrounded in the football world for, for man, God knows how many years. And that's where you look at the setup behind the scenes at these huge clubs. There is a football connection, whether it's somebody that's worked at numerous different football clubs along the way, whether it's a director of football that's worked at a, a different club and another club, may never have played football, whether it is a director of football that had a great career at that club, um, whether it be somebody that, that was a youth player at that club, had a bit of success there but saw what it was like when, the, when things were going really well, whether it be a standout player from time gone by that can really appeal to, to prospective signings. Mm -hmm and can say what it's like at the club when it's at its top. All, all of the above. I mean, how much would it cost? In the, look how much transfers are starting to get into the 200 million mm. sort of mark. If you want a marquee, like, get in there sort of signing, you're talking 200 mil now, aren't you? For some, mm. If you're getting Hazard for 90 million when he's got a year left on yeah. his contract, you're talking 200 for a blow-out-the-water money signing. Mm. Well, at what point, because if you want five of them, you're talking about a billion pound. Yeah. At what point... Does it become way more prudent to hire the absolute top draw, best backroom staff that you could? What's it going to cost? Ten million? Yeah. Twenty million? That, even? That, that and and that's one of the, that's one of the main things you have to do. People talk about Guardiola spending money, and yeah, okay, but your best managers are going to be your best club, so they're going to get the opportunity to spend money. But look at the players that were work, that, well, they were unbelievable when he joined the club. David Silva, De Bruyne, Aguero, Fernandinho. They've all gone up another level since he came in. So he's a good coach as well. He's in the mould now where he can throw a Cleverly and Anderson in. And yeah. they're going to look like world beaters mm -hmm. because everything around them yeah. is at that level that will carry them. Yeah. We're throwing Cleverly and Anderson in amongst Cleverly and Andersons mm. and everyone's going, well, that's not working. Yeah. But it's not going to. Talking about all these 100 million signs, that's, at the moment, that's not the way forward for United. It's not going and getting this one big player. It's about going and getting a group of individual players good, promising, young players that can grow with the team. That fit the jigsaw. Yeah, that fit the jigsaw and can be successful. Right, Danny, this is fantastic, mate. Thank Pleasure you very much. Always, uh, listen, get in the comments and tell him Danny needs his own show, doesn't he? It's as simple as that. Tell him. I'm trying to bully him into it in a minute, <laughs> so help me out in the comments. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Make sure to give him a follow on Twitter, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Laters.